we greet everybody in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are thankful, thankful to be together. And up on the screen, you will see the title of the message. Last week, we heard a message on the authority of God's Word. And today's message is a continuation of this, and it's titled, The Authority of the Believer. We must understand that the key to acting on the authority of God in a Christian's life starts from the foundational level of believing his holy word. Am I right? So recapping last week's message, we address the question, how can God's word be infallible when it was written by fallible men? We read together in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And in 2 Peter 1 and 20, we read, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It was also explained that the authority, the authority of God's word proceeds from the author. It is God breathed. The author is the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of his word is breathed out by God which makes all scripture, not just parts of it, to be profitable and not subject to private interpretation. The author is the interpreter. That is the final authority. And further, we were made to understand that if Jesus Christ, our example, if he used the written word to defeat Satan, Matthew chapter 4, being tempted in the wilderness three different times, he counteract what the enemy brought to him. It is written. And if Jesus Christ is our example, Jesus himself said in John 10, 35, and the scripture cannot be broken. Then this means that we, you and I, can take his word and his promises in the authority of, that we can read it in today. Amen? So we can become enabled with this same authority that provides an armor of God. Ephesians 6 and 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And realize that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature as it says in Second Peter 1 and 4. We, you and I, cannot live victoriously in spiritual warfare without a final source of authority. An authoritative word 
of God. We can't accept what the Bible says about who we are in Christ without this acceptance that his word is absolute truth. Amen? So that's where we pick up today's thoughts that will equip each one of us in the authority that we, you and I, carry as a believer. In Deuteronomy 30 and verse 14, we read, But the word, God's word, is very nigh, very near unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. His word, always providing Jehovah Jireh any time that he is needed, his word is there near us, in us, ready to provide. That's pretty cool stuff. But can I say this? Knowing that God's word is true, that it cannot fail, that it cannot lie, is only the firewall of righteousness unless we act in faith and do something with it. It is just a book unless you and I act on what is written inside of it here. In my office, in my study room, I have stacks of Bibles. I like Bibles. I invest in Bibles. I enjoy different Bibles, the different bindings, the nice leather premium bound. I, I, I enjoy investing in them. So I've got a, a, a stack of Bibles on the corner of one of my credenzas that's always there. And there's never less than six that I've got stacked there. But you know what? They're just books. They're just good lookers. If I don't open them and use them, and I do. Go to that next screen for me, please. Jesus, when he sent out the 70 to minister, said in Luke chapter 10, starting actually in verse 17, it says, In the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, Jesus replied, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, verse 19, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Red letter words of Jesus Christ. Amen? Here's the thing. These were not isolated words reserved only for that particular time and place. It wasn't just reserved for 70. The early church in Acts walked in this same power and authority and it was never written that it would cease after a certain period. There's actually cessation doctrines that say, well, when the last apostle died, all of that went away. I didn't read that anywhere. God's word never is outdated and will never fail. Yeah? 
someone like Paul, who knew from his previous background what he had done in his previous life, realized that in order to carry in any authority, he'd have to put on the garments that identified who he was in Christ. Holy Spirit says in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, against the tricks, the sneaky stuff, the subtle things of the enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you see, at another time we'll spend some time on the specific parts of the armor of God. But this language that was being used right here in Ephesians chapter 6 was familiar language. If you go back to Exodus 12 and verse 11, when they were given instructions for preparing for the first Passover, what is it that was said? It says, you shall girt up your loins, put your belt on. You shall be ready in your house with your shoes on and with your staff, with your rod in your hand. You see, the armor of God was being described even clear back then on that very first Passover night when the blood was applied to the doorposts of the Hebrew children. And we know what happened. Those that were prepared, that did apply the blood, that were clothed with the armor as it was stated, we're saved. Hallelujah. I thank God for his word. Let's go to the next screen, please. To win in this war, you must know who you are and the authority you have as a believer. And being real, before we start enumerating, counting all the different things uh, that fall under the authority of the believer, we must acknowledge that first and foremost, the believer, you and I, is under authority. Under the authority of God Almighty. We're exhorted in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And in verses 14 and 16 of the same chapter, he continues and he says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has Im immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom, come on, be glory, honor, and power everlasting. Amen. It is this authority that we are under. Go to the next screen, please. The authority of the believer comes from God and from God's Word. And as new creations, we have been put in a position of 
power, and authority. A position that was delegated to us by God through Jesus Christ. You see, when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, Colossians 1.13 says that we were delivered from the power of darkness. Read it with me. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated, I like that word, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Oh, come on. I, we got to catch every bit of that word because the word power there is literally translated authority. You have been delivered from the power. You've been delivered from the authority of darkness. What I'm declaring, what I am saying is life. They are words of life that if we choose to speak them out by the authority we have as a believer, they will have results. We've been delivered from the power, the authority of the enemy and placed into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you realize realize how much God must love us? Stop, stop, think. There's got to be some kind of love going there that he would do that. Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. You can read, continue it in Matthew 28, verse 18. That power was given to you and to me as a part of our inheritance in Christ. Are we getting this? You have entered into this position of authority. You were translated into this position of authority because you are are in him. We read last week and what it said in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things, help me finish it, that pertain to life and godliness. And while this power has been given to us through the finished work of the cross, we still must act on being partakers of the divine nature. Verse 4 of 2 Peter 1. From that point of authority. So let me go over just three quick points of what I wrote down here of the believer's authority. Go to the next screen here, please. First point. Through Jesus, our power and authority was secured. It was finished. It was given to us. And it's ours to preach the gospel of Christ. You see, Jesus succeeded in securing all power by going to the cross. That's why he could say in Matthew 28, all power has been given to me. So by going to the cross, dying a horrible death, suffering the penalty for sin, and defeating Satan, he did it because he loved us. God's absolute goodness was manifested toward us through the incarnation, through God taking on flesh, through Jesus Christ becoming the Son of God. God's absolute goodness was manifested toward us when Jesus came to earth as a man to reconcile man back to God and to recapture the authority that Satan had stolen through Adam's 
disobedience in the garden. Remember, Jesus was called the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. After securing that power and authority, he freely gave it over into the hands of those who would believe on him. You and me. It's ours. And it's not enough for us to simply accept Jesus' work at Calvary. There's more. Jesus' words in the 16th chapter of Mark were not only intended for the early church and for, or for those disciples present at that time. God's word and these words of Jesus are just as vital and real today as when they were first spoken. Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, says, Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every born again, born from above, believer has the authority and responsibility to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in this earth. Amen? Jesus said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Who's to do all these things? Them that believe. The signs will follow the believers who act in faith and boldly speak in that powerful name of Jesus Christ. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. We go on and on. They, the believer, is the one with the power and the authority to do these things. Am I right? This isn't performance-based. Did you hear me? The Word of God says that if we do this, if we believe, then He will follow with the signs. It's not, it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus fulfilling His Word when we simply believe. Verse 20 of Mark 16 says, they went forth, they obeyed as believers and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word, there it is again, with signs following. <laughs> Hallelujah. God will confirm his word. But first, it must be put forth. That's where you and I come in. God isn't down here on earth preaching. He's given us the authority to do the preaching. God's not down here laying hands on the sick right now. He will bring the healing, but you and I as believers must lay hands on the sick by faith, believing that God will perform his word. Amen? Go to that next screen, please. As believers with authority, your authority equips you to stand against Satan because we are seated with him. Promise after promise 
was provided in the Revelation letters to the seven churches. Every letter ended with, to him that overcomes. Many, many different promises. Every single letter to the church. It ended with an encouragement, with hope to him that overcomes. And we've already read in the sixth chapter of Ephesians where it describes the armor that we as believers are to wear in combat against Satan. He explains each piece of that armor as the armor of God Almighty. But not once does he say that God will put the armor on you or that God will fight the devil for you. You is the understood subject of these verses. He said, you be strong in the Lord. You put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, you stand. God's given you the power and the authority to stand against Satan and his destructive works. He's provided the armor, but it's our responsibility as a believer to put on that armor and stand against the devil. James 4 says, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. The authority of the believer. You are a believer. The armor and the weapons are at your disposal. God is there with, with us to back us by his word. But it's all worthless unless you take your position of authority and assume the responsibility to use what he's provided. You have the power and the authority to take the word of God, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit and run Satan out of your affairs. Don't pray and ask God to fight Satan for you. You are the one in authority. I don't say that mean. I'm saying it's time to stand up for what God has given to us. Take your responsibility and speak directly, out loud, to Satan yourself and stand your ground firmly, the word promises he will flee. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul prayed a prayer for the body of believers in Ephesus. One part of that prayer was that they would know the exceeding greatness of his power to those who believe, Ephesians 1.19. That exceeding, which means above beyond what we can even deal with in our minds. That exceeding great power is the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead hmm. and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1.21 tells us that Jesus is seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Jesus, our King, our Lord, the one we get to call our Savior. Then verse 22 in Ephesians 1 says that God has put all things under his feet and made him head over the church, which is his body. Are you listening? His church, which is his body. As believers, we are part of his body, yeah? And we are seated with him in that highly exalted place of authority, yeah? 
Jesus even said in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He knew what was going to come down. And he wants us so bad to get this. He really, really does. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 5, and then 6 reads this way. And you has he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Hallelujah. Even when we were dead in sins, God has quickened us together with Christ. Verse 6. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know how much more simple this can get. We've got to be professing, declaring, and understanding the Word of God and what He's given to us in the authority we carry as a believer. We are seated together with Him far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Some may say, all I see is just a bunch of green carpet sitting in this green chair and looking at a load of green wallpaper. Come on. Speak your position in Christ. Encourage yourself as one that is sitting at the table that was prepared for you right in the middle of your enemy, Psalm 23. He said, I've prepared a table for you that you could pull up and everything of the past could be forgotten. And right in the middle of the storm, right in the middle of the enemy, right there, he spreads a feast before us. I recall hearing a message many, many years ago that paraphrasing said, if you would ever Get a hold of how blessed you really are. You'd be thinking and walking differently. And yet, call it human nature or whatever, it's not God's nature. We look at the ground and we walk around. Well, I'm wondering if. I'm going to make it today here. What if we push our chin up, throw our shoulders back, and say, you know what? Enough's enough. You know what? God's Word lives in me. (laughs) I answered the knock. You see, I heard the knock. I heard him knock. I opened up the door. (laughs) And boom. He came across into, I came into his home. And that's where he said, "Ah, welcome, my son. Glad to have you. Everything that's in my house is yours. It was the threshold covenant. He took the door and he opened it. He knocked. I heard and I said, I want in. And I came across. I crossed that threshold and he said, now it's yours. It's all yours. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. It's what he's wanted. But you see, he can't pull you. He can't pull you in. You can hear the knock. And you can look at the door. 
I'm just not quite sure if I can do it today. Step across and see what happens. Step across and see what happens. Step across to what God has for you. He says we're seated together with him. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Just the way it is. That's what God's word says. I can't do anything more about it. I just said it. We're new creatures. We're brand new. I'm not the old man that I used to be. I'm not living the way I used to live. I'm not going to have what I used to do. I've chosen to step across that threshold. The moment you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that same power was exercised on your dead, unregenerate spirit, causing it to be reborn in the likeliness of God himself. Boy, that's something to think about. Go to that next screen for me. Final thought. As new creatures in Christ, we have the power of God's word to exercise our authority. Mark, five, uh, Mark 4, verse 35, says this. In the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Jesus speaking, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they take him. They took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> Quite a question. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto them, Unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Catch what we just read. Jesus spoke the words. Let us pass over to the other side. There was enough power and authority in those words to accomplish the job. This job, or the word that was spoken by Jesus, was delegated to his disciples and they accepted it. They got in the boat with him, and they do what you do in a boat. You row, you, do, you get it to the other side. But when the storm came, they were filled with fear that the boat would sink. Jesus had to carry out the authority, the responsibility of the authority that he had delegated to them by rebuking the wind and the sea. You have the power and the authority to take the word of God, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit and run Satan out of your affairs. It becomes our choice. As captain of our ship, your own ship, you have control over your own life. You have control over your spirit, your soul, and your body. Jesus has delegated power and authority to you over Satan as a believer. Ephesians 4, 27 says, neither give place to the devil. You're born of the Spirit of God, you're filled with the Spirit of God. You've given, been given the Word of God. That right there is enough for you to carry out your spiritual authority right here in the earth. Are you listening? 
give your faith some employment. Give it a job. Give your faith some employment. You say, well, some of you might be saying, well, I, I think that's the problem. I don't have enough faith. Really? Romans 12, 3 says, and as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You see, you're wrong. <laughs> okay? Jesus even said, if you have faith even as little as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, cast into the sea. How's this work? You see, the faith is given a job. You take it. You accept it. God has given when he breathed into you when you came out living, breathing, you have been given the measure of faith. What you do with it, your choice. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus became a man like you and I, partook of flesh and blood. Why? So that you and I could partake of spirit and life. He became a man so that we could become like him as a spirit and life in on earth right now as a believer. Kind of hard to fathom. But it's God's word. That's why we started last week with let it be resolved in your heart. God's word is true. It's not going to lie. It's your foundation. He holds his word above every name. It's, it is what created in the beginning was the word, the word, the word spoke, created. It was the word. That's our foundation. First Peter 2, 1 and 23 says, You are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. <laughs> Woo! Truth. It's there. If we want to go back and dig into it, it's there. You see, we carry the DNA of Jesus Christ. What if you start confessing that? The enemy comes at you with something that doesn't need to be in your body. What if you confess, you know what? The DNA of Jesus Christ lives in me. That's out of here. I'm done with that. It's not going to stand. It takes the authority as a believer to simply get the job done. Ephesians 4.21 says, If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You are the one in authority. It is your responsibility to put off the old robe and put on the new. The power of the Holy Ghost does the actual work in you, but you must make the decision to allow him to do it. Again, choices. Now, with the authority as a believer. And believe me, this isn't hard. This isn't for the really, really strong and super, 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 you know, religious people.
To them that believe, I give you the power. He said, come to me as a child. I don't, I don't think it can get any simpler than that. Many of us have been around children or have had children, raised children. We know that when they ask something, nine times out of ten, we do it. Because we want the best for them. Jesus said, I've given you all that you need. It's yours. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he is appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much more better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus Christ, who lives in us has been appointed heir of all things. I'm his son. You're a daughter. You're a son. And as such, you have rights. You have an inheritance. You carry the bloodline, not of your old, not of your past generations. I'm not... You love your parents. You love what you grew up with in, in the respect of how God loves every man. But you are a part of the family of God and Jesus Christ is now our head. God's power is in his word. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. We need to learn to walk from that point of authority. I truly believe that the enemy works very, very hard. to get us to realize who we are in Christ. Who, what we've been made. It's the single thing that he comes against, your identity. Well, I'm, I'm just not there. I don't have much faith. I'm really not, um, I really, I, 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 you know what? God sees you in your destiny and he sees you as a son and as a daughter who is a believer, who has been given power and without respect of persons God has given to every man liberally that we could have life. John 3.16 doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave us a prayer. No. No. He gave us a son. He gave us a life. That's why we love him. That's why we have the strength to resist temptation. That's why we have hope that in difficult times, in times of grief, in times of illness, in times that things are shaking around us that we can stand knowing he's got me. He said he'd never leave me. He said he'd never leave me alone. He said I'm walking with you. You're in my house. Remember, he came across my threshold. 
And I've got an awesome house. I've got an awesome place. Come on. Come in. Let's stand to our feet.